Thanks for coming out. It's good to see a lot of people are interested in puzzles, uh, which are a very interesting subject. Uh, I'm gonna just recap very quickly who we've got here. Uh, so I'm me. Um, I made a Mario clone uh, <laughs> about, about Rewind, and my current game is walking around an environment doing mazes. Um, <laughs> It's, so, so, but, but to talk about this, these games uh, in a more interesting way, you know, this is a sort of a classical platformer uh, linear sequence of puzzles with a little bit of allowance for nonlinearity, and this game is a fundamentally nonlinear world with a little bit of uh, linearity built in. So there's been an inversion of the, of the way puzzles are presented to the player and approached. Um, next we have uh, Draken, uh, who made this game, Starseed Pilgrim, which is sort of an action puzzly game in the way that Tetris is or something like that. Um, Fishbane, uh, which is a, a platformer with, what, do you, what would you call that? Like functional things, activities that you can do that are... Puzzly? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I called it like a harpoon surfing game just because it sounded cool. That's accurate. Um, and he's made a bunch of other games um, as well. Uh, and uh, Mark Ten Bosch, who made this game, Orb Tower, which is a game about trying to get a ball where you want it to go. It's unreleased, so you haven't played it. Uh, he also made this game, Miegakure, which is about uh, understanding the fourth dimension and getting blocks where you want them to go. It's also unreleased, so you probably haven't played it unless you played it here like two or three years ago. Um, and this game is a little harder to visualize, so we have a little fun video. That so, um, I wanted to keep this more of an open discussion with us sort of just following whatever points seem interesting. So this isn't, you know, stringently, there, is, there isn't a, a list of questions that we're going to plow through. However, I have one to start, um, just to get the momentum going. Because um, it's a topic that I've been, I've been interested in lately and I don't necessarily have conclusions on. Um, you know, there's this idea in game design a lot. Um, like when people are analyzing game design, right, they'll talk about game mechanics, you know, and you know what that is, and, and especially in a puzzle, you know what that is, because the puzzle's sort of based around mechanics usually. Um, and there's this further idea that the mechanics of a game are somehow an abstract functional layer that is different from the visual presentation or the audio mm. presentation, right? right? Um, n not just in the MDA framework where you say something like mechanics, dynamics, aesthetics, but, but in general that's the way it's thought of is, uh, you know, there's actions that are performed and then there's the way those are displayed and you can factor those apart. Um, and, and what I've found personally is that the better I get at making games, the less I believe in that kind of thing. Um, I don't really think those two things are separable. And that's interesting to me because in puzzle games, um, in puzzle games are some sense the most abstracted and discretized kind of game, right? To be a good puzzle, you need to understand what the fundamental operations are and have intent. So there, there needs to be that clarity of mechanics, right? But at the same time, um, I don't think for any of our games that's independent of the presentation. So, in, you know, in Miyagakure, you spent a long time making that game just look good. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, aside from looking good, which I think has mechanical ramifications, just setting up the visuals so that people will understand the level better, yeah. right? In ways that are not strictly functional operations on the level or on the mechanics. And, you know, it's like I, I saw you uh, in an interview on Starseed Pilgrim, you sort of said, well, the game really came together when the music was added, you know, and the sound effects were added, and suddenly things had punch, yeah. right? So that's generally what I'm thinking about, and who, which of you guys has something to say I about have, this? I have a lot to say about this. Right. Um, so, so the the way that I that I set up Miyagakure is that the um, the game is based on these four dimensional tiles. So Minecraft has like three dimensional tiles, and this game has four dimensional tiles, and um, the level is really small so that there's very few tiles. So it's very easy to track. Um, it's, it's really easy to know what the game state is if you, if you just think of just the tiles, because uh, there's very few of them. Um, 
but then uh, your position is still, it's still, it can be anywhere, and things in the world can be, don't necessarily have to fit within the tiles, but gameplay-wise, it's exactly, um, uh, all that matters really are the tiles. So everything that I add on top of that is really trying to get the player to understand this structure that I've set up. And I think, for example, um, working on the, 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 the trees and, and, and every, every object that you see on top of it, like I, I spend a lot of time improving the, the, the way that they function with respect to the fourth dimension, like it used to be sort of a hack in the way that they were displayed, and now it's like more correct. And that more correct part um, not only looks better, but also feels better uh, to, it, it looks better, it feels better when you see it, but also the player picks up on it more. And um, even if it's instinctive, so if you, if you just move around and, um, and don't really, at first you don't necessarily notice what's happening with everything that's not a, a cube, but then after a while, right, I think um, you notice that, right? after a while you start picking up on what's happening and you see, oh, I'm seeing these big slices of trees, right, and then you, somebody, you might pick up on that and then um, there's like, you, you can go very deep into like all the details that have been put in, like the texture on the ground also changes based on where you are. There's um, like there's the one block that has the stripes and just uh, when, you, when you travel through the fourth dimension, the stripes kind of come to, they, they kind of stretch out and it's just one color. Um, right. And it really, uh, like it communicates the idea of a fourth dimension really, like just, it's like, oh, I didn't even think about it that way, but it's, uh, it's really cool. Right. So... Um, yeah, so that's all like in the hopes that the more correct the representation of the fourth dimension is, the more your brain will be able to pick up on the details. Um, with sort of saying like if it is, if the system is correct, then your brain will have a better chance at getting it, which is, I don't know, like I'm, it's still kind of a theory, I guess. Uh, I feel like puzzle games are kind of at their most powerful when they're, uh, very, when they're, the, the systems that they're built on, the kind of the reality that they present is consistent. Um, and like, I think Megacoda does that really well because right. it's all based on like this fourth dimension stuff. Um, and all the presentation goes towards that. And I think uh, like presentation isn't just visual and audio. It's also, I mean, like, I, I guess I have to bring this up because of Starseed Pilgrim. It's also say like a tutorial, like if there's a character telling you what to do, that's part of the presentation. Um, and it's all kind of part of the puzzle because Puzzles are things that go on in your mind, and like the mind's a really crazy thing. And just even the even the subtlest thing, like a little a little hint that you don't even notice, can go a long way towards uh, affecting the way you think about the puzzle. Yeah, I actually have a couple things to say about that right there. Um, so, so when I started uh, testing out the witness on people. Um, you know, I went to a couple places like Game Developers Conference and had people play it in a room and I would sort of sit back and watch and, and do the thing that I had done before about like not really bother people and just sort of watch. And what I learned from that experience is that usually those play test sessions were not useful at all, actually. Mm. For the, the, the subtler and the, the more um, non-classical your game is, um, and the, the more it asks something of the player, the less the, or the more difficult it becomes to get people to have an authentic play experience with it in any kind of artificial environment. So in that case, it's like I'm sitting there in a hotel room and either this person knows like, oh, the developer of the game is sitting here, right? Um, and they feel like they're being watched, right? They feel like they're being judged if they're slow at a puzzle, right? Um, and that, that got even weirder when it was developer friends because then it's like weird, you know, social status things going on. Um, so, so later uh, the next year when I did a, a press tour, so I would travel around to different cities, still with the game in very low level of presentation, so things were made out of blocks and stuff, but it was still supposed to be very clear how to play, I would just leave the room. I would set the press up with the game and I would go to lunch. And I'd say, call me if it crashes, it probably won't. 
you know, 98% chance it won't crash. And then I'd come back two hours later and we'd have a discussion about it. And, you know, that worked a lot better. Um, and that, I think, extends into the game as well. So if you have a game, um, suppose you have a game that, that goes kind of Nintendo style and you start it out and there's a character telling you how to do everything, right? Explicitly. Here's dialog boxes and then won't let you go on until you do the thing, right? Um, in that kind of a game, you're setting expectations for what the player is supposed to do. And I think you'll find them, like later in the game, less able to actually solve puzzles or to stretch or to, to do anything. Because you've, you know, like the game industry got into this situation where we kept making games easier and easier. And I think it's because, like the dawn of tutorials happened and we started doing all these tutorials. There's actually, I was talking to someone about uh, Zelda and kind of like in, in, in a lot of games that are kind of like sort of puzzle, like they're not really committed to puzzle, but they're like, oh, I want to have some puzzles. You'll, there's like maybe like a piece of information that you need to complete a puzzle, but it's, it's not actually the information that you need because you can't solve the puzzle before you get the information. You actually have to go and talk to the person and say, oh, if you push on this stone, it opens the door. But before, if you pushed on the stone, it wouldn't do anything. Wow. Um, and like, like, and, but like in the first, Zelda, I guess, like people, I, the only thing I remember is someone said something about like a peninsula, and it's like, go to the peninsula, but you could have just gone to the peninsula without them telling you. Um, and I think that's like kind of like a big, like that shift is in, in the direction of here's like a thing telling you what to do and um, kind of hovering over you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, the, the, you know, the way I try to attack that now, I mean, we'll see in the next game, because my next game is probably going to be very different. Um, but in, in The Witness, we're very careful never to tell you how to do anything. There's like one prompt at the beginning that tells you kind of what the controls are. But you start out and you're in this hallway and it's like, well, you have to take the initiative to go forward and like do a puzzle. And it's very simple, but you are, you are building your own momentum of, of someone who's going into the world and encountering things. And I think that's, um, that's important. So now you have, a, you have an interesting balance in Miyagakure because you require people to be proactive you have NPCs that sort of tell you things, but they can't tell you that much because they only ever have like a sentence at a time yeah. or whatever. Um, a lot of it is teaching, I, I sort of see two things. I see teaching about mechanics that any regular game would have, like push blocks and jump on stuff. Um, so if I need to teach you about pushing blocks, I'm okay with that because it's just really a basic thing. Um, but all the 4D stuff is all nonverbal, um, so yeah. So that's that's sort of how I split it. Um, but then, I, so so it makes me think about like how do you how do you do that without actually you know how do you teach things without actually using using words, right? And and Star, Star Seed Pilgrim is is like even goes like on the other end, which, where it's like not even teaching you anything. It's like totally about. Discovery. Yeah, and but and, I mean, like even Star City Pilgrim teaches you like the very basic stuff. Like that. I mean, right. it's it's just the like same digging. as like movement and pushing blocks. Right. It's like if you don't know this, like this isn't the cool stuff. I want you to to struggle with because like if you're if you're playing a game and you're struggling with like just the basic stuff and you figure it out, it's not like oh wow now I understand how to push blocks. It's like uh, all right now I can push blocks and now and then, and then there's like that barrier between kind of starting and getting into like what the game is really exploring, which is right. the four dimensions. Right. Right. Well, in, in Starseed Pilgrim, definitely there's there's nonverbal communication that's that you can't even follow up on yet, right? Like, so you start you're you're in the the once you get into the actual world, right? There's like some heart blocks there, and you know before, you know they were sort of in a ramp that went up, and now now they're in, sort of in a ramp that leads in a direction, but there's no way to eat them all, yeah. you know, because you can't, you can't get to the top one until you actually build something which requires you to have gone into the other world, yeah. right? So there's a, there's a mixture of this is telling you something, right? That, that blocks are relevant in this outer world, right? Sorry if anyone hasn't played this game. <laughs> We're spoiling it. Or, um, more likely they just have no idea, like, hard blocks. Yeah, what are these guys talking about? This is a challenge that we have is keeping things, I don't know, interesting, so, but... Yeah. I've, I have to mention, um, because we're talking about uh, the presentation of puzzles, um, there's a game called La Mulana, and I, I, I've been thinking about, like I liked it for a long time, and then I actually thought about the puzzles, and the puzzles aren't good at all. 
Um, they're, they're really dumb. It's, it's all just based on like, oh, you've got like the right item and use it in the right place, or uh, like you just like press down and this turns out you go into this pot like a, like a Mario pipe. Um, but the presentation of the puzzles is is kind of amazing because um, I mean of like there's like you you have to do everything yourself and you can just like walk by a puzzle and it doesn't matter for now um, and like just I think like uh, I I really want to make a game like La Mulana just because uh, it's just this amazing just you're just surrounded by puzzles um, there's a lot of puzzle games I mean it seems like the the easiest way to design a puzzle game is to say like here's a puzzle solve it and even if you're not explicitly saying it if it's like here's level one next comes level two um, it's you're, you're communicating like you have to solve this puzzle right now this is what you're doing um, and I mean I'd really like to see more games where the puzzles are less clear, like, uh, like not, not the solutions, but that they're even there. Um, and the, the, I mean, the rewards for La Milana, it's kind of uh, like a Metroidvania a little bit, but the, the rewards for puzzles are all these like weird stuff. Like uh, there's a bunch of puzzles that you get like more health from, and there's puzzles that give you access to entire new areas. And uh, I don't know, like I, I guess I like mystery in puzzles. Um, like outside of the kind of, kind of like contrived, like here's your here's your box. That's where the puzzle is. I like it to be like I w I'd like to see more puzzles that are like that. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know if Miga Kure has that actually. Um. Well, you, you have a special challenge, right? Because your basic mechanic is very hard to visualize. So you have to go an extra mile in leading people into it that a lot of games wouldn't have to, right? Yeah. Um. And this isn't, I mean, I'm not trying to, to non-legitimize puzzle games that just say, here's a puzzle, like that's, like, that's still a thing. Like, I, I'm still really interested in like, you know, uh, like learning about how something works and then using that knowledge well, to solve things. Yeah, do, guess, we, do we want to pop up the slides and talk about your dependency chain thing? Uh, I don't even know if it <laughs> connects to what we're saying. I'll, I'll, All right. I'll decide, it was, it, it's cool. Um, but yeah, I guess I have optional things that you don't know exist, I guess, yeah. But, and Braid had that too, right? Like, optional yeah. stars that you don't even know exist unless you... Yeah, I mean, those are the obvious optional things in Braid, right? right. Braid has, yeah. has so, this is where I want to say something interesting, but I don't want it to be quoted afterward, so. <laughs> if, you're in the, if you're in the press, turn your brain off. Um, so there's, a, there's actually multiple levels of optional puzzles in Braid, right? Yeah. And the stars is sort of one of them. Right. The stars are um, not, like you have to be a very thorough player to know that they're there, right? But once they're there, it's a very classical deliberate challenge. It's like a hard challenge. It's harder than the main puzzles right. in the game, usually. And it's a, it's a puzzle solving with a tangible reward, right? You get this star and there's, right. you know when you've got all of them and all that. Um, there's other stuff in the game that are puzzles that don't really give you an acknowledgement. That, like it's a softer, um, it's a softer reward state or something. But they're there. Like if you're a if you're a player who's really interested in the game, you know there's it's not that many, but there's probably um, five or six puzzles that are like that. Hmm. Um, and and they're harder to see. I mean they're easier to see because they're right there. You don't have to like bounce off the level or something to get to them, but they're, they're harder to see because if, you, if you're gonna, if you're the type of person who's just gonna go until something stops you, which is often what happens in those platformers, you'll just go right past them, right? So uh, I'm actually, um, I don't know, I'm interested in that idea, right? In, right. in, in the idea that more, uh, I, I don't know how to say this in a less snooty sounding way, but but like the, the idea that you should always get a reward for something good you did is kind of for kids, right? Um, unfortunately, that's what we base most of modern game design on. But, but really, there's this idea that a mature player, the appreciation of the situation is better than like, oh, you got a star, right? Um, it's nice if the game acknowledges at least to remove any ambiguity like oh this is yeah this is what we were going for right but the idea that it has to be a reward of some kind is um, is unfortunate and it's a little bit um, 
like when you design that way, uh, it's a little bit lowbrow, I guess. I don't know. Um, I mean, I guess it's kind of this is like it's kind of we're kind of going off topic, but I mean, most of the time when you solve a puzzle, it doesn't reward. We're talking about rewards, whatever. Um, like, I'm not sure if a, like a star as a reward is like any like I mean. If the reward is going to be a star or nothing, I definitely take nothing. Like, like, and I agree with you there. But um, rewards for solving something, they have like a lot of power to to feed into the rest of the game, um, in in a in a meaningful way. Oh, you mean like in a Metroid kind of way or something? Yeah, a little bit like that. Um, and it it doesn't. I mean, this is just Lama Line again. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You guys have a different topic you wanted to bring up? Uh, I have a bunch of topics. All right. What's the dependency chains? Um, I was talking about how... Um, Let's just do it. Yeah, yeah. let's do it. Yeah, it's fired up. Um, it's kind of an evolution of what we talked about in... Solve this right now. Right. It's kind <laughs> of an... Yeah. You, I mean, like, our talk that we gave here two years ago, um, which was talking about how you want your if you want the you want the player to learn something about this particular puzzle, right? So that means you don't want them to solve it accidentally because they don't understand what you're trying to do, right? Um, and you also so that means you want them to know when they attempt a solution, you want them to know what the you want them to have a model in their head what the solution is going to be and like attempt it and you know see if that worked or not and then you know hopefully you solved it so the way that i set up a lot of the levels in migakure and i think is like the perfect well not the perfect but like for, for me for for this game i think it's great is like make um make the, the space of possibilities that the puzzle can be in very big, but make it so that the solution is really close to your starting point, which is kind of what I'm re re representing here. So like, there's plenty of states that you could be in that are totally out there and you know, don't really, like you're, you're gonna explore this space, but you're not gonna go and actually, um, you might be completely off and never be able to come back, right? Um, but if you know what the solution is, it's like super easy. It's like, you know, like, like four steps in that case, right? Like from start to end is only like four steps or three steps if you, if you, if you count the arrows, I guess. Uh, yeah, a step would be an arrow, so like, yeah. Um, and then, so yeah, so this is just like the st different states that the, the puzzle can be in, and the starting state and the end state, which is the solution. And then, so this is, yeah, so this is kind of like a theory, and then I actually did it for an actual level in the game, um, which is the level that we just saw. So you start over here, and the colored arrows are just so that it represents it better. It's just regular arrows. Um, and yeah, so like there's a ton of states, but the, you know, you can get lost over here, and that's not gonna help you at all, or get lost over here, and that's not gonna help you at all. So it turns out that the solution is just this. Um, and, right, like one, two, three, four, five steps. There's like, there's, there's variations too, like small variations. As long as you end up in one of the end states, you're good. Um, but if you, go, if you go over here or over here, you're, you're, you're screwed. So you just have to know <laughs> that. You just have to know what that means, yeah. right? And um, it's very deliberate. Right, it's just like, oh, one, two, three, four, done, right? Um, yeah, that's really So I'm kinda, I mean, I, I actually, I, can I ask a question that I don't know how I'd answer myself? Right. <laughs> um, how, how, like a, kind of more generically, like how do you start designing like just a level and like do you consider this or is it just kind of like? I think this is sort of a you. second step. The first step is just what is the level about, right? Like so here it's about taking this box from inside a temple um, and moving it outside of the temple so that you can jump on it to get to the goal. So, um, because I knew that taking, there's all this literature about the fourth dimension where they talk about all these, these, these miracles. That, Possibilities. Yeah, all these things that you could do if you could 
move in 4D, right? Um, or, you know, yeah, manipulate objects in 4D. And so one of them that comes up all the time is moving object from an object from, from a closed container, at least closed in, you know, in 3D. Um, and so I wanted to make a level about that, and that was very clear. And so then it was about, like, how do I make it? Um, and um, so then it was more about thinking, like, oh, can I do something like this, right? Can I, can I actually make it so that you, you can get lost in, on, on the sides and, and stuff? You want to answer it too? Uh, oh, like how how do I start making something? I guess so. Like it's kind of a it's it's kind of a weird process. Um, so for me these days, it usually um, I have something an idea that I'm interested in, and what idea means depends on where in the project I am, right? If it's at the beginning of the project, it's really vague. It's like oh, you know, maybe it's rewind or something, right? But as, as you go into it, it's like, okay, I've played around with this a bunch and I've seen some specific things that can happen. And I feel like when this one kind of thing happens, there's actually a lot of interesting ideas that could be explored over there. And so I just kind of start playing with it and seeing what happens. Um, the witness is a little bit different. Like playing with it in the witness was a lot of the time just designing puzzles on graph paper instead of in code, because I could do that and it's faster. Um, and then just like, Looking, I'd be like staring at this graph paper, you know, solving this puzzle in all the different ways in my head to see what would happen. Um, but yeah, for me, there's there's always a question, and the designing of the level is an attempt to answer the question or to get more information about the question. Um, just like, just like a like a like a what if, like with the mechanics of my game, like what if what if I did this? I mean, like I guess I'm talking about myself now, but like. I know that I, when I'm making like a puzzle game, it's kind of like I'm just sort of like playing with what I've come up with. I'm just like, oh, this is kind of fun to play around with. I wonder if I can make like things that are actually difficult to do with it. And then, yeah. well, that's actually the structure of both Braid and Miyagakure. Actually, is you go into different realms that have different different pages of what if questions, right? So like, what if you were across the fourth dimension all the time, also, or what if? Some objects can't be rewound, right? And then there's a whole world full of things that explore that. Yeah, yeah I think a lot of it, from, yeah, like what you were saying, for me it was just like I'm programming this mechanic um, about blocks that can be longer than, you know, that can not just be one by one, but they can be more than that, like two by one or whatever. And then um, I'm just, I have to debug it, so I'm placing lots of objects in there, and I'm seeing like, does this work? And then I realize, oh wow, you can do that. Like, oh, you can float over there, or like this block is just floating in midair for no reason. And then, um, that's a lot of the levels were just made that way. It's just there's an interesting parallel there. <laughs> yeah. Between what I was saying earlier, like somehow the ideal puzzle game player, at least of one of the games that I want to make, is. Is, is gonna try and go a little bit beyond the basics that people might expect and like be inventive and, and bring something to it, right? And I think, I think there's different kinds of designers when, when they sit down and design a game, right? Some people are just like, look, I'm making a game where you throw rocks at enemies and once they've typed that in, like they've got their game sort of, right? And you, yeah. and you try to make interesting levels, but there's a different, there's a different quality that we're talking about though, which is, which is, I've, I've left no stone that I'm gonna throw at enemies unturned, right? <laughs> in the way that I throw it and, and at whom I throw it. And that, that generates most of the magic most of the time, right? It's like, for, for uh, both Braid and The Witness, for me, most of the best moments of the game I didn't picture when I sat down to start making it. It's like they came in this process. Yeah, it'd be interesting to, to know about you know, that for your game. Like just like coming across things I didn't really expect. Yeah, or just like for example, like you did you come up with the mechanics beforehand and then explored what would happen, or was it like I'm, I'm sure it was like there's some a few um, so steps I mean, at least in there. With Starseed Pilgrim was really weird. Like I don't even really know how it happened. Um, it was also a long time ago, but like I just sort of I, I had the idea of like planting seeds and they grow into shit. Um, I can say shit, right? Yeah. You already did. <laughs> Twice. Um, and it wasn't very fun because I just had these, this one seed and it just grew into stuff because I thought it was a good idea to make it actually grow into plants. 
Um, and then it kind of got abstract, and I just, I just designed them all out on a piece of paper, and I was just like, I guess this is kind of like a cool set of blocks, and I just coded them all, and they turned out to, be, to work. Oh, so um, it was like first. But then, and then like, uh, I mean, there's stuff that happens later on that some of you know what I'm talking about, and that was just like, I, what would happen if this rule was applied? And um, it turned out that a bunch of them were just really weird uh, kind of reinterpretations of what you've been learning the whole time. Which is actually really similar to what's going on in Braid and Yagakure, actually. Um, it's a little different in Starseed Pilgrim. It's a little bit less structured. Yeah. Um, but it's the same kind of thing. Yeah. And I mean, uh, a lot of the things that I've made, like uh, I made a game called Fishbane, where you're just this little guy and you, you throw a harpoon um, and you can, you can jump on top of it and you, you fly along. Um, but that wasn't really the original intent. I just, I just wanted to make like a, I, I, had, I thought maybe like when the harpoon sticks into a wall you can climb onto it and that would be cool puzzles. Um, but I mostly just wanted to have like a guy like having, holding a harpoon and like being able to run with it. And so I just made it so you, you threw a particle, um, which was the harpoon, and if you were holding move at the same time, it just kind of looked like this little guy holding a harpoon running with it. Um, and then it was just kind of like, what if, like cause, because you're running along with it and I was jumping, I'm like, what if you could just land on it? And I just played around on this test level for like an hour flying around everywhere and it was awesome and then I made a game out of it. That's not in question. <laughs> There's, the, I mean like, are point and click adventures puzzle games? Like if it's just like, like, <sighs> I <laughs> <laughs> yes and no, right? I, so, yeah. so the interesting thing about point and click adventures is they, they run a continuum from having all the classic problems of adventure games, which is that, yeah, you're pointing and clicking, but every place that you could click is like a different if statement in a piece of code, and you, you can't oh, yeah. have any intention as the player, if statements. you know, because it's, it's just like, I clicked on this one pixel, and then the vampire came and bit me, and then I... <laughs> lived for a thousand years and flew a spaceship to another planet and now I'm in the next scene. It's like, that's what adventure games were like a lot of the time. Um, but sometimes, uh, sometimes they get more systemic. And it, systemic is not even the right thing um, because I don't think it has to be a system. But you do want the ability for the player to kind of know what the game's about and to be able to make a plan that sounds like a plausible thing that might solve a puzzle before actually right. doing it, right? Right, like the system might be faking it, but it's still pretending to be about something, and then you're, in your head you have a mental model of that system, and that's what, when you formulate a plan, that's what you're using. So if there's like, for example, if it's something about water running um, and turning a crank or something. Like, yeah. the water might not be simulated properly, but you're, you're, you in your head can think about yeah. Yeah. that. Right? Well, actually, in the days before Point and Click Adventures, Infocom actually got some shred of this idea and started doing a pretty good job of it sometimes. So, like, um, the Spellbreaker series, uh, for anyone who's old enough to have played those, um, you learn a series of spells, and the spells are just little verbs that you can type in but they work consistently, and they're implemented with if statements, but it's like, look, if, uh, if you have this unlock spell, you can use it on anything that's locked, right? And uh, another one that's systemy in a slightly different way is called Nord and Bert Couldn't Make Heads or Tails of It, which is like a, um, it's a word game game, and you actually have tools that operate on words. So like there's this one thing in it called the T remover where you apply it to any object and it takes the letter T out of the name of the object. Mm. And usually that gives you garbage, but sometimes it turns one useful object into another useful object. Right. And so, so that idea even existed back in the 80s, right? right. And that, that's pretty cool. And yeah. it's, it's too bad we went through a dark age when people forgot it. There's a, just kind of on the same note, you're talking about like magic words. There's a, it's like, no one knows about it. A few people know about it, but it's a little text adventure, like an indie text adventure called uh, Suve Nux. Um, S-U-V-E-H-N-U-X. Um, but in it, you, you kind of like find this spell book and you're not supposed to have found it, but you find it. Um, and it has like maybe like five spells, um, but they're all made of like multiple words. And the words actually sort of form like a little language and you can just start combining them in different ways to what the spell book taught you. Um, and I mean, that's kind of like just like if statements too, like uh, if you make something sticky, what does that mean? Like that's one of the spells. Um, and I think, like, I mean, that's really cool, and it's all if statements, and it kind of becomes more systemic. So then, are systems always necessarily better than st still, or like, is 
or if statements like Well, the thing about a system is you're kind of, you get a, a better level of consistency for free. Yeah, and you also sure. potentially yeah. get depth for free. Well, I you also get surprise, right? Well, you get surprise. Yeah. And that's like that's like what people like to call emergence, right? Like when, when right. you make a system and yeah. it's like, oh, surprise, now it's well, really cool. So emergence is, there's two kinds of surprise, and they're related, right? So one is surprise to the player as yeah. they're playing, yeah, yeah. right? And that's like Spelunky kind of surprise or something. And actually, both of them always happen, because as soon as you start making surprise for the player, you're going to get surprise for the designer, too. Probably. Um, not always. Not if it's just something that like you make like pop out at the player. But like if it's yeah. like emergence. Oh well, yeah, a monster closet though is yeah. not the kind of yeah, surprise. Yeah. We're talking about emergent kind of yeah. surprise. Not like twist ending surprise. Yeah. <laughs> um, so and that's what's interesting to me as a designer is the surprise to the developer, which can then turn into surprise for the player. Hopefully does usually. But for me, that's always a good sign that I've progressed as a game designer in my understanding of the craft and of using games as a lens to view the world is, is when I got some new surprise by asking some of these questions, right? Yeah. And so you don't get that with if statements, but you do maybe get a kind of a playable game with if statements. So I don't, you know, I don't want to go into some kind of, I'm, I definitely subscribe to the system's religion, but I don't, I don't want to be here to preach the system's religion because um, there's other ways of, of doing things that are interesting as well. Yeah. Just be careful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It makes me think about how when I when I designed a, a when I designed when I started designing that game, it was it was about exploring the fourth dimension. Like I didn't know anything about the fourth dimension almost. Well, I knew the math because I, you know, took linear algebra or whatever. But um, um, and so it, just yet this exploration was very important. And I'm not interested in playing a puzzle game that's been designed by a human in the sense of like, oh, I've made these puzzles, they're fun, play them, right? Um, I, I care about like these very interesting topics that are very, um, you know, complicated. And so um, it, it goes towards like the, the authorship thing, right? Like when I, when I design a puzzle, like it's about trying to be as simple as possible, but it's about a thing that's 4D. Like it's not about, you know, jump over here, jump over there or whatever. Um, and so it's, it sort of feels like I'm not the author of the puzzle. It's just, uh, yeah. You're just kind of like, this would be, like, maybe this is a cool thing. And then, and then you try it, and it turns out it's cool. And they make it a level, and then the player's like, oh, yeah, that is cool. I agree. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. So that, that makes it harder to, like, how can you do that with, without a system? Like, how, yeah. It's um, I, I was trying. I was thinking about making a game once uh, that kind of. You, I mean, I've made a, I've made a couple of games once that use kind of like a little like arbitrary language, and it was just like, oh, you know, these numbers mean these things, um, or like you, you, you have, it's like a, it was like a, there was like a hacking game, and you type like little words, um, and you eventually kind of like learned how to use those words to to complete the game, um, and then I was like, I should probably be using like real things, like like because four dimensionality, even though it's not like. A real thing that we we deal with in real life, it's um, like it's 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 something that's that like is like an extension of reality. It's something that you consider and like learn about reality from. Um, and I kind of, but it's really hard to do that. Uh, it's really hard to make like a puzzle game that's based on something that even if it's like kind of like a realistic extension of reality. Um, so I mean I I mean I feel like Braid does uh, that too because it's just like like time is an extension of reality and that you're both kind of exploring this. Sorry, my nose. Um, and and like like fish brain isn't about an extension of reality. It's not like oh, what if you could jump on a harpoon in real life? Like that doesn't. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know. Like do you, do you feel like like I, I'm just curious like how you guys feel about like arbitrary systems as opposed to kind of maybe more realistic ones. Um, I the the thing that comes to mind to say at least is. Um, so as I design more stuff, I'm moving away from reality plus augmentation. Like the witness isn't really that, and what I'm thinking about doing next really isn't that. Um, but also to go back to the interactive fiction example, um, you know, you were talking about making a game with words that do different, mean different things. Have you played the Gostack? It's an interactive fiction game. No, I haven't played the Gostack. So, so it's um, it's a game. You should. Uh, it's it's. Um, it's, a, it's an interactive fiction game that takes place entirely in a made-up language, but that 
sort of shares the structure of English, right? So it's a it's a um, it's sort of a linguistic philosophy oriented game, right? So um, you know the, the word and and or and whatever will be recognizable, but the nouns and verbs will all be totally fantastical things, um, and. In an interactive fiction, you use verbs on nouns, right? So you very quickly have to start figuring out what these things mean, but you don't really know what they mean. Even like halfway through the game, you've got like, oh, this thing, <laughs> this creature, I think it's a bird-like creature somehow because of the way it's being described, but I don't exactly know, you know? And, and so you're trying to figure out, yeah. Um, it's really interesting, and so what, what that sort of, how that's relevant to the current discussion, I think, is um, if you go far enough in a certain direction, if you have enough interesting subject matter, you can shed light on something interesting. It doesn't have to be about the physical world, right? So in this game, you get some insight into your interaction with language and the way language helps you picture things. And it's sort of an exploration of that without ever being pedantically so, right? It just naturally happens. Um, yeah, I don't, I, to go back to the harpoon thing, I think, yeah, that's, yeah, I don't know. I'm okay with that. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't object to it. Um, that's good. Yeah. Um, but it, it, yeah, it would be nice if we went, like, to really, and go and explore different, different topics, not just the fourth dimension, but like, you know, um, like, I think, <laughs> yeah, I think Papers, Please is an exploration of... That's exactly what was going through my head. Yeah. I was, I was is it, to say Papers, Please. Yeah, it's an exploration of like being in that position. And, right. and it, like it's not really a, like a puzzle game, but um, like I feel like, I don't feel like it's, an, it's not even like, I don't know, like puzzle games are kind of like in this big category mm -hmm. to me of like just things that are like exploring these uh, what ifs, and more often than not, puzzle games are very mechanical, and I think that they were kind of like the first games that were like, what if this, but they were always like abstract and stuff, and like, uh, and games like Papers, Please is, it's also um, just a really well explored what if, but it's also not a puzzle game, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, thank you everybody for coming and putting up with all this.